Do you know what most people miss when it comes to all things Web3? And is Web3 really decentralized? And will this Web3 hype fade or flourish? And how will the metaverse unfold and transform enterprises? And what really makes NFTs valuable? And can we really prosper during this crypto winter? Hopefully these questions, folks, have piqued your interest ahead of today's discussion. So my name is Rob Hanna. I help lawyers with their careers and to land their dream jobs. I'm also the host of the Legally Speaking podcast. We're a top 1.5% globally ranked show. We were the first legal podcast in the world to be sponsored by a legal tech unicorn and the very first to launch our very own Web3 creator coin. We have an interactive community chat called our Legally Speaking Club Discord, which is fast growing. So if you're curious to know more, you're more than welcome to send me the word Discord and you can join our community there after this event. I'm also a speaker, advisor, investor to recruitment and legal tech startups and Web3 and a regular LinkedIn product beta tester folks and the host of this product, LinkedIn Audio Town Hall. But aside from all that jazz, I always say I'm a proud first time father and pour it to my miniature dash hound dog, both who feature on my content from LinkedIn from time to time because I want to show my community the personal and human side as we know LinkedIn is changing. But that said, for those of you who know me well, I love to collaborate with the right and like-minded people. So today we have a very special guest when it comes to all things Web3. But before I go into further introductions, I should let you know that this room is being recorded all the content shared is purely for educational purposes. No legal advice is being given whatsoever. And we'll be running around an hour or so. So in the meantime, if you could kindly hit the invite button, get some of your friends, some of your connections into the room so we can all learn and mastermind together. Feel free to also take a screenshot, tag myself, fellow co-hosts, and maybe share some of your learns from today with your community. So with that in mind, I would love to pass the mic firstly to Mitch Jackson. But before I do that, our dear friend and fellow collaborator on these Mondays, Francesca Witzberg, um, unfortunately had a personal matter today. She is one of the world's top IP attorneys, and she usually shares the stage with us, sharing so much high quality content when it comes to all things IP. So I'd strongly recommend giving her a follow. And she wanted to pass on her hellos and thank yous to Ira personally in her absence for taking the time to be here. So with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Mitch, who undoubtedly, in my opinion, is one of the world's best legal community builders. He's a top entrepreneur, top trial lawyer, and leading the way, folks, when it comes to all things Web3 and the metaverse. He even had the very own Gary V in his metaverse penthouse recently. So Mitch, over to you for a further introduction, then back to me, I'll introduce Ira, who you very kindly connect us with today, and then we're going to get into it. So over to you, buddy. Rob, thank you. Ira, I think I can speak for both of us. Whatever Rob's got in his coffee or tea, I want some of that. Your enthusiasm, Rob, is just infectious. And, and it's just great to be here today. I also know, having practiced for 36 years here in Southern California as a litigator, litigating and trial lawyer, when to keep my mouth shut. The questions you asked at the top of the show, Rob, I just want to mute my mic and hand it over to Ira and let him answer each and every one of those questions. Why? Because Ira is the OG of tech lawyers in the Web3 space. This is the guy behind the scenes and sometimes, you know, in front of the camera, helping all of us navigate uh, the legal and business side of Web3 tech. We, Rob, thanks for noticing and mentioning, are definitely doubling down, tripling down on the metaverse. Uh, we've got a couple of new platforms, every one where we're displaying past interviews of some very interesting, fascinating, and prominent people. Ira, you are in one of those interviews. Rob, you will be in one of those interviews. And if anyone's interested in seeing what we're doing in the metaverse space, just go over to my blog, MitchJackson.com. Look at the last three to four blog posts and you'll see our metaverse penthouse. You will see a new metaverse space we set up that will walk you through our 46 top negotiating tips, approaches, and secrets. Uh, the same negotiation approaches we've used over the last three decades uh, to resolve multi-million dollar cases for our clients. They'll work for creators, artists, and business people in the Web3 community. And uh, having said all that, Rob, I'm going to mute, pass the mic back over to you. It's good to be here. Share this out, everyone. Get your questions ready. And let's uh, let's have Ira definitely share his his years of wisdom with us so that we can move forward in a more purposeful and intelligent fashion in the Web3 space. Rob, back to you. 
Ah, thank you so much, Mitch. And absolutely, I needed to bring the coffee game for the uh, for the greatest of all time. I absolutely agree. And I'm going to briefly introduce some um, IRA folks, but I want to mention this is also an inclusive space. So we want you also to learn. So if you have questions for IRA, once we've got introductions out the way and I've got some initial questions, feel free to raise your hands, come up onto the stage. We want to make sure that you all get an opportunity to learn as well. And I just want to say hi to my good friend, John, who's bounced into the room. Good to see you, Sabrine. Great to see you. Maria. Maria is also doing very interesting things in Web3, has also launched her own creator coin. So definitely check out people in the room. So folks, we are absolutely joined by the GOAT today, the highly talented Ira Rothkin, who's a high-tech attorney, entrepreneur, cube computer technologist, building blockchain and NFT technology. And he is a leading advisor and legal counsel to companies in the internet, entertainment, cloud services, blockchain, and video game industry. Just a few and folks that are a lot. So you definitely want to check out Ira's profiles. But companies that he has helped start counsel include FriendFinder, which is social networking, Pandemic Studios, which he negotiated a spin off from Activision and started the company, ArenaNet, the makers of Guild Wars, in which he helped obtain the seed fundraising and started the company along with persons formerly with Blizzard, and many, many more, as I mentioned. And also, he is very well known within the media, regularly appearing as a guest legal expert on television and radio, including the likes of CNN, Fox, NBC, CBS, and the list goes on and on. So a very, very warm welcome, Ira. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Robert, uh, for the wonderful, kind introduction. Generous Mitch Jackson, as always. Thank you very much. And uh, I do have to echo uh, Mitch's words, Robert. Uh, you're like breaking the record for like the best moderator that I've heard so far <laughs> in the in the cloud for uh, for law and for things like that. So I really appreciate uh, you being here today and. Uh, I hope I can live up to the hype. I probably can't. But just to give you some understanding of my morning here, I'm in California. Um, I woke up. I uh, tried to work out. And then the plumbers came. And I had to get on my hands and knees and try cleaning up a flood that was occurring. And uh, almost missed this uh, podcast in, in this morning. So... Uh, wonderful, nice things to say, but life goes on. So I appreciate it. Well, firstly, thank you so much for the kind words. But secondly, we really appreciate, given your personal circumstances and what happened, you you, you being so committed, folks. So um, give us a heart emoji for Ira. Let's hope he gets everything sorted. And and let's get into uh, to learning some fun things when it comes to to Web3. So Ira, let's start with 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 some of the basics, um, you know, because we've got different variations of people with Web3 knowledge in, in the audience. What's your definition of Web3? All right. Today, I'm not giving any legal advice. Um, everyone knows that. So, And these are just my views, not the views of any of my clients. Um, I have to say that the my definition of Web3 is a two or three dimensional, usually graphical, but the graphical depiction of social media. It's a, it's a software layer. And that's where I stop. So basically, if you want to get right down to it, it's a glorified interactive inter entertainment layer on top of what we used to call social media. So, uh, you know, that's my jaded view of it. Um, other folks may have a more grandiose view of it. In a perfect form, it would be decentralized. But currently and for the foreseeable future, it will probably be run on central servers due to latency and other um, quality control issues, typically AWS and things of that nature. So, and they usually have terms of use and license agreements in common. So you usually have to go through a click wrap, uh, a layer as well. So that's kind of my, my jaded, honest view of it. No, and I appreciate that, and I think it's uh, it's it's a great view, which um, I absolutely echo. And and I guess that when you talked about sort of centralized, decentralized, that was going to lead on to my next question again for folks who might be less familiar. What what are some of the reasons people that you know say what's wrong with centralization, and can Web three really decentralize the internet? What are your thoughts? Um, Web three 
for now has very narrow use cases where Web3 or, or decentralization is super optimal. Um, they tend to have to do with blockchain and things you could put inside of a token. And then nearly everything else is going to be Web2 or lower, you know, IRL in real life. Uh, Web3 would fail miserably without Web2. You can't really market it through Web3. It's great for using encryption and putting things onto a public ledger and doesn't really go beyond that. So uh, I think a, a lot of folks um, glorify Web3 and decentralization. And I think there's going to be a trend more towards centralization and then only using decentralization where it's absolutely essential, such as, for example, crypto tokens and, and uh, NFTs. Yeah, and that's an interesting point because that's what I wanted to to talk about next. And because uh, I know Mitch, you're doing so much work in this space as well. So any questions for Ira at any point, jump in too. Um, I mentioned in the introduction what really makes an NFT valuable, and I guess my reason for that question is we may have seen the initial hype where people were, you know, purchasing PFPs for astronomical sums, and people were like, why would I pay just for something like that? So, you know, from your perspective, what really makes a, an NFT valuable, and if people are thinking about NFTs, what should they be considering to ensure that they don't necessarily get scammed or fall into any traps like that? Well, we're on kind of a legal centric show today so let's get into the first sale doctrine and this is kind of my you know a point that i kind of re reiterate each time i do one of these types of uh, questions and answers and what we have with nfts in my view is legitimate it's a legitimate economic ecosystem people you know a lot of folks including a lot of my friends think it's just jpegs and hype and you know why someone's spending all this money on on a jpeg but we need to look at the legal and economic underpinnings of an nft and in the past we'd have the first sale doctrine which is basically um, the ability of somebody to buy a physical piece of art or a record album and then to resell it and if a record album for example becomes a collector's item well you could you, know, you could sell it and make a profit same thing with artwork all the joy and, and adrenaline rush and and enthusiasm and economics where someone buys a, a Picasso for one price and then years later resells it, um, that's made possible by the first sale doctrine. And the first sale doctrine, simply put in the United States, is the notion that once you own the physical artwork, the copyright owner really has no say over how you go ahead and dispose of it or display it in your home or in a gallery. Um, they're still the copyright owner but they can't stop you from how you use the physical artwork. And so that allowed for the economics of collection to go on, for Christie's and Sotheby's and others to flourish. And for years, as we moved into the internet era, uh, we weren't able to do that with digital works. For one, some, one reason or another, you know, in the early days, clip art was kind of close to that, but then it was only licensed for a CPU. And and so it became very, very difficult to create a collectability uh, for digital uh, artwork. And if somebody tried to copy it and claim first sale doctrine, they'd get sued into oblivion because the first sale doctrine didn't apply to digital works, which by its nature were not physical and for which you have to actually make copies in order to transfer it. So Getty Images had a good licensing regime going on, but again, no collectability. And then finally, the blockchain manifested and folks figured out, well, wait a second, in order for this to actually make a lot of sense, we got to give something that's kind of like the first sale doctrine. And the way you do that in digital works is to provide for non-exclusive private viewing licenses. That could be sub-licensed or actually the licenses assigned. And so that's what the blockchain ledger is about. That's what NFTs are about. The token represents the non-exclusive license holders license and if you transfer that token you've now transferred the non-exclusive license and that is roughly emulates the first sale doctrine but for digital works and then all of a sudden the economics followed with people you know for tens of millions of dollars back in uh, 2021 for that auction to take place kind of legitimize the art market 
And now we have a huge economy, although there's been a downturn lately for macroeconomic reasons. But the economic underpinning of collectability tethered to the transfer of what's usually non-exclusive, non-commercial licenses is the major innovation in our lifetime that roughly emulates the first sale doctrine. And so this is a wonderful time for us to be you know, alive and to be participating in this. And I'll stop right there to see if you have any questions on that. Well, Ira, with respect to the first sale doctrine, talking about traditional legal concepts and then you know integrating them with with what you and I have talked about in other shows together in the Web3 space, I read earlier this week or late last week that the U.S. Copyright and Trademark Office uh, is doing a study on NFTs and how they can or should or will they be applying traditional IP copyright and trademark principles towards the uh, non-fungible token space. Have you had a chance to look at that? If so, what are your thoughts moving forward? Not necessarily just with NFTs, but on other traditional laws applying to the Web3 space. Uh, Well, I haven't looked at that in terms of formulating any kind of response. I've certainly have looked at that and done deep dives over the you know, a good period of time on viewpoints. And there are significant uh, legal bugs in the NFT ecosystem, which may be underpinning why the office is doing that at this time. Um, You know, here's a few of them that folks may never have contemplated. And it basically makes the NFT ecosystem completely buggy. You know, for one, you know, uh, the NFT license agreements. Uh, I've been working really hard with Consensus Mesh on fixing the NFT standard lately. The current standard is a 721. We came out with the EIP 4910. But what we noticed is that, particularly for second generation sales, the license agreement is usually non existent at the point of sale. So buyers aren't taking the license subject to any notice. The standard the legal standard for e-commerce license agreements or, or terms of use even is uh, clear and conspicuous notice and opt-in consent. Some projects, for example, who use OpenSea may put their license agreement links in the description and come close to that. The vast majority don't. The license agreements are not included in the JSON files, which is the metadata for NFTs. And so the vast majority of license agreements. I don't mean terms of use for a platform now. I mean license agreements for the NFTs, you know, what you're getting. Those things are probably not binding. So people are thinking they're collecting NFTs. And when these things start getting litigated one day, in my humble view, the vast majority will not be subject to a binding license agreement, which may affect valuation and predictability and a whole host of other things for both sides of that. So we have what I call the consent gap or the consent bug. We also have a bug where NFT owners are quickly realizing that when they buy, for example, you know, any, I'm not going to use any names of NFTs, but major NFTs for profile picture memberships, that they don't have standing, at least as copyright owners, to go into court and file suit. So if somebody's using their image on social audio or social media, the only party that has standing to sue in court for copyright infringement, it's not the non-exclusive licensee, it's the copyright owner. And very rarely do they do that for their licensees. And so folks are getting a rude awakening that they can't do much. There may be other novel theories, but they can't do much on the copyright front to stop uh, folks from, from essentially uh, copying their images and then we have the, the one that's really a sleeper, and that is uh, 17 U.S.C. 203, which is a copyright termination statute. And I haven't really seen anyone discuss it with NFTs. Um, you see it with you know people, musicians getting their music back after 35 years and filing the proper notices to terminate licenses and copyright assignments. But there's a whole host of collectability problems when you have a copyright termination statute that's not available in the first sale doctrine for physical works, but sure as heck is available for 
licensees in the NFT uh, environment. And so folks may not have, you know, one day the non-exclusive license. Maybe they will. We'll see if case law changes that or if Congress changes that. So those are sort of three examples of bugs that need to be addressed. And I think it's really good that the Copyright Office is starting to take a look at this to see how we could uh, have consumer protection in the NFT era. Just to, to jump in, and Mitch, uh, by all means, we weren't joking, folks, when we said we had the GOAT when it comes to all things Web3. I think I have learned, I've been in the Web3 circuit for, for a little while, but what Ira shared there is absolutely fantastic. So uh, I really just encourage you to ensure that you give Ira a follow and make sure that you're getting used to being in these sort of communities. Make sure you're using this room to network with people. And I just want to take a quick poll of the audience just to gauge where we're at when it comes to NFTs. Then Mitch, back to you, buddy. Who has previously bought an NFT? Give me a thumbs up in the audience if you have previously purchased an NFT. Okay, interesting. Now, um, give me a laugh emoji if you are afraid to buy an NFT. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you're not convinced. Maybe you're still a bit uncertain. Give me a laugh emoji if you're still in the camp of not sure about it. Okay, great. And even Ira himself, after, you know, he's probably got the most amount of knowledge. And Mitch has secondly also got a hell of a lot of knowledge. So these are the sort of people you want to be speaking to, networking with, and connecting with. So, uh, yeah, really fascinating comments. Appreciate everything you shared, Ira. Mitch, back to you, buddy. Just wanted to get the thoughts of the audience. I got a kick out of that too, Rob, because while we're purchasing and, and using NFTs, we're also very cautious, right? About the links we're clicking on and what exactly, why are we purchasing the NFT? Is it to become part of a community? Is it for an investment purpose? And and for all of the reasons that Ira just so eloquently shared with all of us, we want to be careful. We want to do our due process. And Ira, speaking of due process, you know, understanding that we have a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners here in the audience uh, listening to the recorded version of today's show. And by the way, everyone, this is the time to raise your hand, jump up on stage, meet Ira, ask him a question. Now's the time. You got to take action in life. But Ira, uh, moving forward, you know, starting today, if we're a creator or an artist and we want to go ahead and leverage the power of Web3, specifically NFTs, what are one or two things you think we should focus on in moving our business activities forward? We understand the downside. We understand the dangers. But, you know, I'm minting this afternoon or I'm making my first purchase tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. What are some th basic things that consumers can look at moving forward to stay safe, to maximize the value of what they think they're doing in Web3 and to hopefully have a nice, fun and productive experience? You know, everyone's di everyone's different. Um, and so the folks who currently thrive in Web3 and NFTs are folks who are the most sophisticated, who the who are the most uh, risk adverse. Um, you know, when, when folks ask me, what's the best way and the best manner of buying an NFT? Um, I say the answer that's axiomatic, and that is by being the one who actually makes the NFT or being on the team that makes the NFT. Uh, then you have the, the most due diligence and you're selling the NFT. And that's the best way to get involved with NFTs is to actually sell them. Um, I also have to say that the biggest risks come with roadmaps. Now, some of the, <clears throat> the best selling NFTs of all time have roadmaps. And Ira, um, can you tell everybody what a roadmap is? A roadmap is usually something that's a brief description of where the NFT project is headed. Uh, it can manifest even before the first NFT is sold. Sometimes it manifests as NFT, the NFT project evolves. Uh, they're usually related to membership NFTs, like things like Bored Apes, and the other is Doodles. And they have elaborate shows and presentations and hype. And these are some of the best-selling NFTs in history. And so when you have those, uh, you also have the risk of fraud and deception, or what I'll call accidental fraud and deception. 
When you're buying NFTs for artwork, that's the safest way to buy NFTs. If you know the artist, if you're sure it's the artist themselves who's selling the NFT, and you know you're buying the artist NFT that you like, and there's no roadmap, so there's nothing to be deceived about, that might be the least risky way currently to buy NFTs. Um, when you start adding roadmaps in, then you run the risk that people are lying, people run out of money. Um, it's essentially investing in something where they would argue they don't even have a fiduciary duty towards you. And typically when you invest, you want the people who are selling to you to have a fiduciary duty when they have a roadmap or future work. So best way to buy NFTs right now would be to buy art from an artist that you know, to use a reputable platform like OpenSea, um, and to avoid believing the hype on roadmaps. Also be very careful about Learn how to use your wallet. Learn about cold um, you know, holding your NFTs on a you know with a USB encryption key. And I think one of the famous ones is Ledger. I think I have like the original one. Got a new one too, but I wonder if that's a collector's item actually. Um, so those are some of the thoughts that I had about that. Yeah, I want to ask you about Ledger in a second and pass this along to Rob to uh, see questions from our guests coming up onto the stage. Thanks for coming up, everyone. But, you know, the power of NFTs, everybody, they can simplify everything we're doing. So we, Ira, as you all know, we recently purchased an NFT of a penthouse suite overlooking beautiful Miami and through a couple of clicks integrated it into our spatial metaverse account. It was easy. It was fast. And the outcome was just, I think, outstanding. Had it, having said that, before we clicked on air anything, before we purchased this particular NFT, which is available through uh, exclusive, we did our due diligence. I made sure that you know what we were purchasing was a legitimate project. I made sure that the links I was clicking on were properly connected safely to our MetaMask wallet. Uh, and so I love the value or the upside of simplicity and a quality product via an NFT into the metaverse. On the downside, for example, you mentioned Ledger. Did you see David Bian our mutual friend David Bianchi's uh, video this weekend of receiving a fake Ledger product in box, which was shrink wrapped, but was preloaded with malicious software designed to hack David's account? Did you see his post on that by any chance? I didn't, but uh, typically Ledger and others tell people to only buy directly from Ledger and not through Amazon. I hope, uh, I hope, did, uh, did David get it directly from Ledger or was it? Just you know what it was? To, so right. here's the clever thing about it is it was sent to him as a gift. And a lot of us receive uh, as brand ambassadors and things like this, everyone, we receive these, these types of things each week. And it was, you know, loaded for bear, ready to take over his system. But when he shared the video, you would not know by looking at it. Uh, that this for most people wouldn't recognize that it was not a genuine ledger product or it was, but it was altered on the, on the inside of the device, Ira. So it, it's an, there's a lot of sophisticated criminals out there. And I think everybody just needs to be careful. You know, um, going back to um, web two, um, there's a person that I know who's, who's a very well-known hacker and he described for me, how back in the day, um, people he knew would go to like Comdex or some of these major computer events and they would drop in the parking lot multiple USB keys and people were less sophisticated in those days so they thought they got a free USB key because what the heck, right? So they plug it into their laptop or their PC and it's, you know, got Trojan self-loading stuff on it, software. And even before the blockchain existed, that type of hack was very, very prominent. So I guess the takeaway is if you get a USB key as a gift or you find one, don't use it. <laughs> Do not use it because the USB key for Ledger is actually also a USB key and it could load Trojans of every variety on there. And so uh, I know David. I consider him a friend, 
I wish I could have actually talked to him before he used it. I, I, I hope he didn't have a terrible result. No, I think he caught it ahead of time, Ira, and that's why he right. did the video. But yeah, we need to share these stories to keep everybody uh, up to speed on all the elaborate scams that basically are just simply reproduced from what we saw in the real world before the internet to what we've seen through the last 20, 25 years up through today. It's uh, it's an interesting time. Rob, let me hand it back over to you. Ah, thanks, Mitch and Ira. Loving the, uh, the the conversation, and I hope you all are in the audience. Give us a thumbs up if you're in enjoying today's discussion. I'm certainly learning an absolute ton. I'm really enjoying things, and you know, like like with all of these things, sometimes if it's too good to be true, folks, the reality is it might just be that. So, with that, would like to say thank you so much to our speakers who are coming up to ask questions. Appreciate you being patient. And again, if anyone has any questions. For Ira, take the opportunity. We've still got about 30 minutes or so. So let's make sure we uh, all learn and ask what we want to know. So is it uh, Matai or Matei? You have the mic. Please do correct me and welcome to the uh, to the show. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, Matai, you got it right on the first go. Um, thanks so much for hosting this space. This is my first audio event in LinkedIn that I've joined. Um, I'm mostly active on Twitter, uh, but but cool to see the LinkedIn space expanding. Um, came here after Ira posted the link in Twitter. Um, I have had the pleasure of working both on Ira's team um, and as well as he was our legal counsel for a project and also on the other side of the table where um, he was the legal counsel for a partner and we were negotiating an agreement with each other. Um, and just want to say throughout, Ira, thank you so much both while we're working on those projects for continuing to educate and really love to see you continuing to share your knowledge in, in these spaces across Twitter, Clubhouse, LinkedIn, um, always learn something. So primarily now I'm focused on helping nonprofits get into the NFT space with a platform co-founded by Deepak Chopra called Save a Love. And one thing we've been really getting a lot of questions about and asking for a lot of help on is the creation of DAOs, um, decentralized autonomous organization, the sense that you can use crypto and NFTs to govern voting rights for a group of people tracked through on-chain interactions. Um, I, I was wondering if you um, had any advice to share on kind of around DAO formation or launch? I know all non like non-technical legal financial advice, um, but just as nonprofits are considering using NFT technology, have you seen any use cases where this was done really well? Um, do you have any recommendations for just kind of like the general concept of, of giving out NFTs for um, DAO membership? Currently, and the project we're specifically working on is we're airdropping people an NFT to then become a member of the DAO to support voting on proposals for what this nonprofit does for community impact projects. Um, I feel like that's a lens that isn't often talked about in this space, really on like the social impact side of things. So I was wondering if you might just open open that can of worms real quick and um, share any tips or advice on NFTs for nonprofits. Matai, great to see you and thank you for your, for your kind words. And uh, for full disclosure, yes, indeed. Um, one of the companies that I work with, Infinite World, uh, did work on a large part of the infrastructure for Deepak Chopra and, and his team, and uh, it was wonderful. And uh, it was for you know uh, it raised money for great causes. Um. So in terms of nonprofits, here's where I come out. There's a whole host of lawyers I could promise will disagree with me on this, but I suppose my approach would be more conservative, more prudent. I think that NFTs are great for nonprofits. Um, once the macroeconomic impact uh, in crypto and NFTs in our society as a whole is alleviated, I do believe strongly that NFTs will come back as well as crypto. I do not believe that what's going on right now is unique to crypto or NFTs, and other folks do. So that's kind of the split. But I, I think if you want to see a good indicia of when crypto and NFTs are coming back, just go back and take a look at your you know top 10 favorite internet-centric stocks. And when they're kind of back to where they were, I believe crypto will be back to where it was. You know, Amazon, Facebook, Google. Just watch those and then watch the price of ETH and and. and you know, uh, Bitcoin, and I think it's going to correlate. 
So when that occurs, I think they'll uh, again be uh, pent up ownership of crypto. There's not a, many ways in which folks could um, use it. And one of the great ways to use it will be making donations with it. And they'll be there to get it. And if, and if NFTs are involved, even better. But how? How do you do this? How do you take DAOs and make them fit for charities? And because at the surface, it sounds like a great idea and it'd be really easy. But when I've looked at it, as, as other lawyers have, it starts to get a little, little difficult. You know, when you have charities, you want to have transparency. Um, you want to, you got to know, you have to do some KYC, right? You can't be a money launderer by accident. Um, you got to have AML. You got to avoid conflicts of interest. You know, charities may be getting money in and then hiring folks to work for the charities. And, you know, if DAOs have all sorts of anonymity or lack of transparency, the folks with the biggest votes may actually have conflicts. You don't usually get that in the real world because you got to know who's voting. Um, and if someone, if there's a board of directors, who's on it? So charities in its purest form flourish with centralization and full transparency. DAOs tend to do well with anonymity and distribution and decentralization. So how do you go about reconciling this? For me, you mentioned it, Matai. I believe that DAOs can be really great as voting mechanisms if you can have details which leave final decisions to folks with fiduciary obligations. That's where I'm at. If DAOs could be used, though, as really good voting and sentiment and community um, engines subject to some oversight by a board that's compliant or compliance oriented, I believe that's the best recipe. I would not leave final decision making to the will uh, of a DAO in this current era. But I do think that in the vast majority of situations, the folks who actually run the organization could be highly deferential to the feedback they're getting from the various forms of DAO voting and automated methods. So that's kind of like my um, parge, just right approach to using DAOs for nonprofits. Ira, if I could jump in real quick, and Matai, just following up on something Ira and I have talked about in other shows is if there is a dispute, if there's a problem, if there's a conflict, and I don't know about the rest of the world, but most of my business clients seem to experience issues each and every year. If we go into court, and I'm speaking from the, through the eyes of a, a litigation and trial lawyer, when I go into court and uh, litigate against a corporation or defend a corporation or limited liability company, we, set, we have a set of established rules and regulations, both statutory and case law, that I can rely upon to make arguments on behalf of my client. If I'm going into court, and I'm just speculating, uh, defending a DAO or going after a DAO entity, uh, depending on what state I'm in, I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure how that entity is or is not going to be classified. I don't know how that entity is going to be treated. Maybe it'll default back to a general partnership. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so I don't want to be on behalf of my client that first test case where we're not sure how much it's going to cost, how long it's going to take, and what the final outcome from a judge or a jury is going to be. So there are a lot of uncertainties. And with all of that in mind, I don't know, Ira, I would say 90 99% of the time, we're still recommending most of our traditional businesses doing business and migrating to Web3 that approach us about creating a DAO. Oftentimes, they're better off with a more established uh, type of C or S corporation or limited liability company. What do you think about that, Ira? Um, yeah, I mean, look, the, the, um, for trial lawyers, high-tech litigators, you think about discord well you know that's really what people are using for DAOs. you think about subpoenas uh you think about um e-discovery and ip addresses and picking off folks who are major players in the DAO and making them named 
and you could have an absolute mess. You know, one person's DAO, if the DAO goes too far, is another person's racketeering conspiracy. And so it's just, I agree with everything that Mitch said. I think it's easier to really litigate the heck out of a DAO. Um, and I do agree that if one's not careful, you could have general partnership type liability where the wealthiest folks in a DAO may be held joint and severally liable for dumb decisions made by people they don't even know, um, who don't have as much in the way of assets. So it's a very risky thing. Now, I do think that the, the future of DAOs is bright, especially as we start moving into securities compliance. And if Congress could act and provide guidance on how we can have more simpler versions of securities compliance, um, I think that the first generation of NOTs have shown us that if we can have crowdfunding done in a way where there aren't footfalls and where there isn't too much friction, it's going to create an incredible economic revitalization of NFTs if you can have basically simple securities as well as DAOs. And then people have ownership interest, they'll have equity, and the world become much more flat for crowdfunding and startups. Love it. Thank you so much. And uh, Matai, what a great question. Uh, we were going to move on to DAOs, and your question just covered it completely. I just want to give you the chance. Did you want to say anything back to what you'd heard from Ira or share any comments before we jump to our, our next speakers? You know, the, as always, it just brings up more more questions, but I'll save those. Um, if anyone here would be interested in maybe doing like a nonprofit and NFT focus space um, on one of these platforms someday, would love to to dive into more details. But thanks for letting me raise that question. Thanks for your thoughtful responses. Um, took took some notes, and we'll definitely follow up with our legal team to to make sure we stay in uh, out of the path of any potential litigation. Hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed for you on that, Matai, for, for sure. And absolutely, we would love, uh, feel free to connect or uh, offline. We'd love to do a, a space. I'm sure Mitch would be up for that as well, um, particularly around the, the spaces that you're involved in. And just before we jump to Tejas, and thanks for, for being here, who in the audience is a fan of DAO? So you've heard what they are. From what you've heard from uh, the speakers and Ira thus far, give us a thumbs up if you are a fan of DAOs. Okay, interesting. And then give us a heart emoji if you're still a bit unsure. So if you're still a bit unsure about DAOs or not 100% convinced, give us a give us a heart emoji. Okay, great. Interesting, interesting folks. So uh, and this is why we all need to come together to learn, to ask questions, to, you know, to debate, discuss. And one thing that I've certainly learned, if you follow the right people, which most definitely on stage, Ira and Mitch definitely are, and people I hold both in high regard, and I've been following Ira for a long time across social audio, the likes of Clubhouse, Twitter spaces, you can really get access to great content and learn. You know, there, unfortunately, there are a number of bad actors in this space, so it's so important that you speak and connect and get into the right communities where people are happy to share knowledge so you can make more informed decisions. And that's why, you know, myself, Mitch are so keen to put these spaces, safe spaces out to people so you can learn and hopefully meet new connections and you know we can all prosper together because certainly the communities i'm in mitch's and various others i'm always learning meeting great people connecting and just want to encourage you to make sure that you get the right people in your networks as all of these technologies look to evolve so let's um ira let's talk a little bit more about sort of regulators and and the metaverse are the regulators really ready for the metaverse well the regulators are never really ready for anything, um, and they do play catch up all the time. Uh, and to be fair, uh, you know, folks go into politics with varied backgrounds. Um, and just like society as a whole, you're going to have some regulators who are nerds like us, and they'll be ready, and others who aren't. Uh, I do think that with the executive order that came down from the president of the White House a number of months ago, that we are starting to rally the various branches of government to be doing deep thinking about crypto and NFTs. Uh, and, you know, I, there's a lot of work going on in the EU and in Asia. Central bank digital currencies are starting to become a very important thing. And, but there's also a large amount of overlap with politics and power. And, 
the G20 did a lot of work in 2021 on promulgating some recommendations for legislatures from member countries, and those are starting to manifest. If you want to go ahead and Google that, it's the Financial Action Task Force of the G20, and you can read their recommendations. And those are the types of things we're probably going to see in legislation in the U.S. and other places. So are they ready? Not perfectly ready. They're catching up. But we're definitely seeing progress on multiple fronts. So, Ira, what about Web3? You know, you're well invested in this space. You know, what current or recent news stories have you read that most surprised you? And I know we could go down the rabbit hole here and there's quite a lot of different stories. But what are some of the recent things or a recent story that you've read that has most surprised you when it comes to thinking all things Web3? You know, I mean, I hate to be jaded, but barely anything surprises me. What surprises me is actually the lack of litigation to date. But I'll, I'll answer that question, I think, the way that you intended it. And I would say the recent cases uh, involving crypto and NFTs, um, we have prosecutions starting to come out of the Southern District of New York, which is kind of like the capital of white collar and securities prosecutions. Uh, I know that office. Um, they're, they're very sophisticated. And, you know, they, they are back in around and the May beginning of June prosecuted six companies in crypto and NFTs, one of them for a rug pull. So we have the first rug pull prosecution. We had a prosecution also recently um, regarding uh, Coinbase employees who, uh, who were being accused essentially uh, of tipping. Those prosecutions tend to avoid using securities law. They use, you know, the Wire Act, which is basically fraud plus a wire, which is the Internet. And so you have, on one hand, an NFT rug pull. On the other hand, uh, folks who worked for Coinbase allegedly tipping off friends and family to some of the new alternative coin offerings that are about to manifest on Coinbase. And uh, those folks traded in it and evidently made money. Now, they're using terms like insider trading, but they're not using security statutes. And so we have this collision. And the prosecutions do surprise me, even though I do believe, not that it matters to the government, but I do believe that uh, the prosecutor's office is acting in good faith, and these are weighty questions, and there's no doubt a consumer protection issue here. Uh, I would think that some of these early cases would be brought civilly and not criminally because uh, it would be bad to have experimental criminal cases and put folks away who, while on the surface of it, you know, through the allegations may be seen to be being bad. But in order to be able to put someone away and take away their liberty, it would seem like there has to be predictability. There has to be a significant amount of knowledge so you could avoid, uh, you know, being involved in a crime. And when you have Coinbase making a living off of transacting in many, many, many alternative coins, and they're able to do that, one would think you could rely on the notion that they're not a security and that securities type laws wouldn't apply. And in, with the uh, NFT rug pull situation, you know, that one actually is more explainable as garden variety wire fraud. But the only thing that stood between being prosecuted and not being prosecuted, arguably, is one hour with a lawyer who could have put disclaimers in their roadmap and disclaimers in their terms of use. And probably would have had the same result in the sale, but then they could point to the disclaimers as saying you can't rely upon this and therefore it's not wire fraud. We also had one with uh, OpenSea, a prosecution with OpenSea where the person who was in charge of what kind of NFTs are being featured uh, also was involved in front running. And again, in the art world, and, you know, the traditional art world has a big metaphor to NFTs. Front running is legal in mo many instances, I should say. 
you know, if you go and learn that there's going to be a, an artist being featured at a gallery and you buy up all their artwork, you know, that's a technique. That's <laughs> a technique that a lot of the galleries and a lot of the art collectors would use. But if you use that same technique in NFTs and someone now wants to call the NFT not artwork, not a non-exclusive license to copyright, but a security, now all of a sudden it's called front running. And so there's a lot of folks out there who may say, well, we don't like what happened, but you got to give everyone what the rule is first. Give society notice so they know how to conduct themselves. And each of these instances was allegedly bad conduct, but arguably these folks are not in the position to actually even know what the rule set is they're subject to. fascinating stuff Ira. i'm i'm just learning so so much and uh just give me again in the audience if you're enjoying the conversation and what ira is sharing because we've been doing these quite regularly throughout the mondays but this one i'm thoroughly enjoying and it's just a real pleasure to to have you with us ira i'm so grateful for your time and folks we only have about sort of five six minutes left so now is the time to raise your hands if you want to ask ira a question take advantage he's busy he's got lots of things going on so we can't promise we're going to bring him back anytime soon so do make sure you take this opportunity so ira before we you know mitch and feel free to dive in as well i just wanted to ask the quick question what most excites you about web3 what are you most excited about well um i'm excited about the first time in history as i mentioned earlier that we have economics to support uh, nfts and collectability that the blockchain is allowing for something that roughly emulates the first sale doctrine that people could own and dispose of as they see fit their non-exclusive license in artwork and collectibles. That is a major, major innovation. It makes the world flat. It allows folks in underserved jurisdictions to make a great living by selling into, you know, folks in wealthy nations. And it really is a great boom for artists and and um, just creative people of every variety i am extremely excited about that i'm extremely excited by uh the work that we're doing over at consensus mesh on things like treetrunk.io our new nft standard which tries to fix a large amount of the bugs that i was mentioning before including uh, consent management so that the license agreement is juxtaposed to the nft and we have better consumer protection. So check out treetrunk.io for that. It is put into the public domain, the source code. So that's not a pure shill, except for the fact that we worked on it. And I also am very optimistic for the way that NFTs integration into video games are going. Um, back in the day, I did work with folks from Blizzard. We created ArenaNet. Um, which was, you know, which was bought up by um, NCSoft, and we came out with Guild Wars. But during that era, we saw a lot of aftermarket activity, and that was around 2000 for digital assets. I think digital assets could really grow, um, and I think it's a wonderful thing. We have to figure out how to keep kids safe and not allow those under 18 to participate in that. But I do see video games being a great use case for NFTs. So I'll stop there and see what Mitch has to say. All I have to say is thanks, Ira. This has just been a wonderful hour of conversation. I did not appreciate that unique twist that you shared regarding the open sea matter. And that, that to me, um, is an interesting take. It'll be interesting to see how things progress moving forward. I would love to get Ira, everybody, on one of our virtual stages inside one of our metaverses and do a presentation with as many people as we can squeeze into the room, Ira, from the digital stage via our avatars. And uh, I'll just leave it at that and reach out to you. Thanks for joining us today, Ira. This was just a wonderful conversation. Rob, you are a master when it comes to moderating, to keeping the room moving forward. We can, you know, I'm just glad you're not a trial lawyer, my friend, because if you were, I would not want to uh, answer ready standing next to you in front of a jury. I think I'd end up at the losing end of that, uh, of that week of trial. That was fun. Thanks, everyone. Uh -huh.
<laughs> far, far too kind, Mitch. Appreciate you. I'm not too sure with your uh, credentials and what you've achieved. You're one hell of a, a trial lawyer and a uh, great human as well. And very kindly, thanks to you, you made today possible. And, you know, you connected us with Ira. And Ira, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've been following you for, for a long time now, probably a couple of years, and really enjoyed all the spaces. And remember the rooms on Clubhouse with our good mutual friend, Awin, you used to do. And just hours and hours giving up your time to educate, help people. So would love to just pass the mic to you for any sort of closing comments or how people can get in touch with you or, you know, anything else that you, uh, how we could help you as a community, given you've been self selfless today. You have the mic. Feel free to take uh, as long as you want. Well, thank you very much, Robert and Mitch, for your kind words. And yes, um, I do re recall our evolution out of Clubhouse and, and I, I look forward to it in the future. Uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, we're done with kind of like with the first main phase of NFTs. I think also blockchain and crypto are maturing. We're going to see a lot of legislation. Uh, I think in a year, maybe a year and a half from now, there'll be some legislation and we'll be looking back at this era and say, oh, my God, I can't believe how unregulated it was. Uh, I do believe that the era of the NFT platform will be coming to an end. Um, I do see technology in the pipeline that I call Moda, Mint Once, Transact Anywhere, where folks will be able to um, make NFTs from their operating systems, right mouse click on any <clears throat> image or file, and <clears throat> boom, you'll have a, an NFT in the blockchain. So it's not going to be this elaborate process. Gas will be virtually nothing or just so insignificant that it won't matter. And that folks could just have NFTs lying around and deciding if and when they ever want to sell them, if at all. Same thing for proof of existence. Right mouse click. You then have proof of existence written to a blockchain that that particular file existed, which is good for evidence and for um, all sorts of verification. And that's all going to be on the system level, also on your phones. I think mobile is going to be really super key. And I do believe, um, and this may be a little controversial, that Apple and Google and others um, really hold significant weight in the friendliness and adoption of, um, of NFTs. Once they're app stores and once an iOS, you could start doing NFTs, it's going to open up mobile gaming and mobile gaming and mobile applications, I do believe, is the key to, um, to significant acceleration of NFT acceptance. So Mint Ones, Transact Anywhere. You don't need a platform in order to buy and sell NFTs. People will be selling them on their own blogs and websites. The technology's out there. Um, consensus and my team help build it. And that's what we're going to be seeing in the coming months. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm, I love these. This is my first um, LinkedIn audio room. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you introducing me to this uh, platform. I hope to do some more in the future. Well, we would absolutely love to uh, to have you back in, in in the future, Ira. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you. And and folks, if today has been you know quite a steep learning curve, maybe you've heard the words rug pull, maybe you've heard minting, gas fees, and just thinking I'm not quite sure how to connect all the dots. Then take action. Give Ira a follow. Follow Mitch. You are most welcome to join our Legally Speaking Club Discord community, where we're sharing very active, up to date content related to a lot of this topic. We we want to try and help as many people as we can all learn and grow together. So thank you all so, so much for your time today. Please do take a screenshot and share some of your learnings with your communities as well. LinkedIn is encouraging us to do that. That's why they're giving us all these resources as community builders, creators to help people and be positive. So please make sure you do that. Don't be selfish. Share it with your communities. And we'll be back hopefully same time next week with our dear friend Francesca for another topic related to Web3. But for now, from all of us folks, goodbye.